All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Just wanna see who's here. Hi, Andy, hi, Morgan, hi, Grace, hi, Maddie. Perfect. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and call this evening's meeting um, to order. This is the Sustainability Advisory Council meeting. Um, let's see, Scott, will you please call the roll? Sure. Tomas Delgado. Madeline Garbas. Here. Stacy Gloss. Here. Megan McGinty. Andrew Stump. Here. Morgan White. Here. Grace Wilkin. Excellent, thank you. Um, with the five, I can't count, but I think with the five of us, we do have a quorum, so we'll go ahead and proceed this evening. Um, let's see, in your, pack, in your meeting packet that you received from, um, from staff earlier uh, last week, you should have received the minutes for the previous meeting that happened back in August. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes. I will second. All right. All right. Moved by Morgan and seconded by Andrew. Were there any changes or um, corrections that need to be made to the minutes? They look good to me. All in favor of approving the minutes, we'll go ahead and we'll do a roll call for that. Madeline Garbas. Yes. Stacy Gloss. Yes. Andrew Stump. Yes. Morgan White. Yes. Grace Wilkin. Excellent, that passes, thank you so much. Does anyone have any changes or additions that they would like to make on the agenda this evening? Uh, maybe a sub addition, especially since it was in the minutes before of um, Megan and I looking into language availability. Maybe that's like a subsection of the bylaws. Okay, can you say that again? I just it cut out just a little bit and I heard you saying, so Megan and you were working on the bylaws, which I understand. But language about that, is that what you wanted to add to this? Yes, and especially since it was in our meeting uh, minutes from last week or last meeting um, about language accessibility, having our posts and information in multiple languages. Thank you. We'll um, add that under item number eight under unfinished business. Thank you. Anything else? All right, with that, I believe we are ready for the staff report. Good evening, Commission. Um, first, some updates on our closed landfill. Um, we did confirm approval of a new, <clears throat> excuse me, a new Champaign-Urbana solid waste disposal system agreement between Urbana and Champaign, both councils have approved that agreement. Um, we're going to be moving on to some work on the cuss words landfill later this year. We have a, an up gradient uh, sampling well which is uh, not performing properly and needs to be replaced. So we will be uh, going out to bid for that work later this year. I'm also uh, happy to announce that yesterday we released with the Midwest Renewable Energy Association a request for a proposal for geothermal installers for a new bulk geothermal purchase program modeled on solar Urbana Champaign. Uh, geothermal Urbana Champaign will make it easier and cheaper to get new geothermal systems, energy systems installed at homes and small businesses in uh, Champaign County, Piatt County, and uh, Vermilion County. So same three counties we've, we've been doing for solar Urbana-Champaign. Solar Urbana-Champaign has 
13 contracts signed this year so far for a total of 85 kilowatts. And that triggers our first price reduction at 50 kW. Um, Scott, so we'll, can I interrupt you for just one second? Sure. You said 13? 30. 30, thanks. Correct, 30 contracts at 85 kW of capacity. Um, our first price discount is at 50 kW, second at 150. So that's the goal we're working towards now. Um, still time, a month to sign contracts. Um, we're, I think we're finishing solar power hours tonight, our last solar power hour. Uh, but folks can still, even if they're just hearing about it now, can still get involved. They can register their interest at solarurbanachampaign.com and they'll get a call back from the vendor to do kind of a pre-screening and uh, if warranted, a site assessment for a new solar array. Uh, switching over to U-Cycle. Um, we've been doing some additional uh, collections, more frequent collections at some select multifamily apartments near campus. Um, we're, we've been having some trouble keeping up with the volume of in-part cardboard at a lot of uh, apartments. It's just a change in the economy, we think, uh, based on so many things being delivered these days. Uh, we're also coordinating that effort with code enforcement to ensure that the garbage is, is behind these multifamily apartments is also collected on a reasonable time schedule. Some updates on Urbana's community solar array. Um, we have conducted several webinars now with our uh, subscription manager trajectory energy partners. Um, we're also reaching out to a lot of local agencies um, to share information with them so that they can share with uh, the, the folks that they work with. And uh, we're already signing up um, folks for subscriptions for Urbana's Community Solar Array. Construction will likely start later this year, um, but we can go ahead and sign people up uh, and, and they'll be ready to go to enjoy those benefits of Community Solar when this system is energized. Scott, yeah. mm -hmm. um, for that one, I was so curious for the webinar that I was able to attend, how many participants were in the webinar? Do you have a sense of how many people were in one and the other or both together? I think we had 14 in one and 11 in another. Okay. So um, those are pretty good numbers based on what we see with Solar Urbana Champagne. Uh, solar power hour webinars. Um, we've also seen in solar UC as well as community solar that um, almost all of the attendees stick to the webinar all the way to the end, which is really interesting. Um, not, not all that common in other webinars. We are seeking uh, co-hosts for future webinars for um, community solar. Um, co-host means uh, we, we, you know, co-brand, we market together, and we give the co-host an opportunity to talk at the beginning of the webinar about who they are, their organization, and why they're supporting community solar. Um, and that's a really good way to, you know, connect with a broader constituency. So, um, so we're, you know, folks who are interested can certainly contact me. And if you, if folks have any other uh, ideas about you know, how to reach folks who might, households that might be interested in um, discounted electricity supply through community solar. Um, we definitely want to pursue all avenues. Moving on to our urban forest, the city has submitted a letter of interest to the Lumpkin Family Foundation for a grant to study the intersection of tree canopy coverage, vacant tree sites. So sites we've decided are good places to plant a tree in the right of way, which we have not yet planted, and environmental justice zones. Um, we may change that to, to some other demographics that, uh, that may be better aligned with um, racial minority and low income, but that, that's the general idea is to bring in that equity uh, lens to our work in our urban forest. So if the foundation uh, believes this project is a good fit for their 
their goals, they will invite the city to submit a full application. So that'll be a lot, uh, a lot more rigorous um, uh, submission. Um, but we're hopeful we've, we've talked with our existing provider of um, tree data and, and public facing tree data um, uh, uh, presentation, you know, the, the website we've talked about here at this commission, um, which is uh, urbana.mytreekeeper.com. And uh, they're uh, very experienced with this type of GIS and aerial photography work. So um, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll get some grant funding to pursue that project. The next sustainability, sustainability advisory commission meeting would be October 6th at 7 p.m. in council chambers slash Zoom. Excellent, thank you. Are there any further questions about the staff report at this time? Morgan, go ahead. I just have a lot of questions today, I guess. I, the, um, the environmental justice zones, how are those defined? So, um, before, you know, a year ago, my answer would have been different people have different definitions. There's no prevailing, you know, federal government or legal definition. However, uh, solar for all, Illinois solar for all, uh, did create did, did create a definition for their own purposes for the purposes of um, uh, low income community solar projects and other uh, low income qualified projects and so that is one op one option we can simply use the Illinois solar for all environmental justice zones we may want to consider that those are fa that's fairly restrictive um, there may be other ways to interpret or define you know, environmental justice uh, communities that might be a little bit more broad. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but a few years ago, the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, I say a few years, sometime in the last decade, the, um, the Champaign, the RPC did a analysis of stormwater in um, what I think they called environmental justice zones, stormwater issues and flooding in certain areas. So I might want to touch base with them about my vague memory of something they did like that. Yeah, our, our grants management division here may also have some, some geographic boundaries that they use for housing programming. So there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different ways and we'll have to consider what's most appropriate. Um, I think it could be a really great opportunity in a lot of these projects and particularly co-hosting the community solar stuff to live out some of our bylaws about inclusion and diversity to an email Scott to talk more. Um, I just wanted to bring it up to the group as well. I think that there's some really great opportunities in these things. Any other questions? Okay, not hearing any, we will go back to the agenda. All right, so the next section that we have on our agenda this evening is the approval of the updated commission bylaws incorporating diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the commission that worked together um, in pairs to review the bylaws as they had in order to submit um, uh, changes for, for the bylaws at this time. Um, so let's go ahead and see, Scott, should we put the draft up for folks to be able to see that collectively? in order to see all of the proposed changes that were made. Now, the first thing that really stands out to me about the proposed changes was that folks ended up um, working on um, 
kind of, I believe what looks like all of the bylaws um, and, and making some suggestions there in addition to working on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and environmental justice statement. Um, I'd like to have a discussion about that this evening, about the, um, about the proposed changes, and uh, to just learn a little bit more about how that process was approached and what, um, what your ideas have been on this. Maybe so, giving us a little bit of insight and background into this process. Um, Morgan, I think you're, yep, ready to jump in okay. here. So one of the things, Maddie and I worked together, we were the pair, and I just wanted to say it was really useful <laughs> to put it, don't mean, I don't mean to sound cold, but it was so useful to have a youth perspective, okay? Because I've worked with bylaws a ton, I'm really used to them. Um, they do have this, uh, they tend to be you know, 50 cent words or dollar, you know, $10 words, or whatever they're called. And, um, and Maddie was saying, you know, this is just hard to hard to read in general. And last year, last month, we had such a great conversation about how do you make it more accessible so you're not using language that um, that is exclusionary in some fashion. And as she and I were chatting about it, we thought, well, why don't we put definitions at the beginning? Because some of these terms are like, what like what's a quorum? always a question, right? So we just started collecting words. And then the other thing is because there are so many words. So the um, one of the language accessibility websites that I had looked through after last month's meeting talked about not having really long sentences, making them shorter sentences. Well, when you have to say City of Urbana Sustainability Advisory Commission, that's a whole bunch of words that really just to us is like SAC. So if we define it up at the top, then everywhere else that it says it, we can flip it into just SAC. So you're shortening the sentences and making them more readable. So that, that was a lot of what we went through was trying to, trying to, instead of using the big words, use just very straightforward, more natural language, I would say. I don't know, Maddie, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, Maddie, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so I, I, Morgan laid everything out really nicely. Um, I definitely, I kind of focus more since I haven't read, I don't like very much or like any at all of the bylaws and all this stuff before. I was trying to focus on like, where was I starting to like wander and like started like or stopped actually understanding what was being said. So I tried both um, like proofreading a little bit and it was um, it was obviously really good. But yeah, the definitions was super um, helpful to me because some of the stuff I didn't even know. Um, so I, I definitely like where it is now. And I, I would say that I've, I've actually had like my sister look at it and we've, it's, I like where it is now. Like other people my age can understand it. Thank you. I will say that we, we listed some definitions that we didn't include definitions. <laughs> I wasn't sure, like when we say natural resources, uh, Mm. I I was I thought those maybe deserved more of a conversation with this with the commission, um, or I wasn't sure if we had a predefined meaning of natural resources maybe in the climate action plan. I don't, I don't think so, but I'm not no. Okay. It's God's shaking his know that there's not a natural resources section in the comp plan. Is that right? Was that the question? Or I, I was talking about in the climate action plan. Oh, the climate action plan. But really just no. a definition because it's in the ordinance, but. No, it's not. Okay. Um, I like the idea of having the um, 
definitions of terms up front. And I think that might be something for kind of like another round of uh, brainstorming or revision, if that's a possibility. I guess it was kind of like, let's add this one part of the bylaws and we're kind of redoing it all, but it seems um, appropriate to me. I guess I'm wondering if you think so, people with more uh, experience in it, but it seems to make sense too. Um, if we're going to do it and it's not very often that it gets done, it might make sense to just remove it all and add in some new stuff. So one thing that, that I'm kind of thinking here, and I really, I like the idea of adding um, definition of, of terms um, to the section that specifically relate to the language that people see more like frequently throughout this document, like SAC, the Sustainability Advisory Commission. Um, I'm not sure or if in the previous or existing version of the bylaws, if we do have the um, definition of sustainability, but I agree with like having a definition of sustainability in there. And then when you see, you know, acronyms like DEIJ, instead of having to spell out diversity, equity, inclusion, and environmental justice every time, um, that, that, that makes sense to be in here as well. I think that we can also utilize um, some of the white space on the SAC website as well in order to provide some definitions of items that may not necessarily, you know, be like something that, okay, we need to have these dictionary definitions or our understanding of, of these definitions necessarily specifically in the bylaws. Um, but that we could use some of that white space as kind of an educational space on the website itself so that it would become easier, for example, to modify or change a definition as we've learned over the last, you know, couple of years that as like, as our, our definitions of things change, right? Um, and so I think that that's kind of important to me is that when we're thinking about the, the bylaws, um, as a as a as a document that that sets the procedures for the SAC here and for that to kind of codify the procedures of the operating procedures for the SAC that we want this to be less mutable and less of something that we're going to come back to and and revisit but some of those more mutable things things that um there are definitions for that things that can be amended or changed or that we really want to have that conversation about that um i think could be in some of the white space on on the sac page if, if folks agree with that um so i would like to hear from uh, I'll just call on Grace first and then Andrew maybe second um, about, you know, tell us a little bit about the approach that you took and some of the edits that you may have made in this process. Um, I focused on the, um, the, the new additions, um, but I definitely do like the idea of um, definition of terms. Um, I worked with Megan. Um, although we didn't do too much collaboratively, I had some things on track changes and it was just kind of some wording and some comments um, about, mm, sorry, I was checking my notes because I wrote them a while ago. Um, yeah, just about if it's part of the comprehensive plan and how we carry these things out, which I know is maybe not part of the bylaws, but just something important to keep in mind, I think. Okay. Andrew, do you have anything to add? I guess I, when I, I started doing, uh, revising the section four, I guess, or section five, and then realized there were some things that, uh, and other parts that could be changed. So I just went ahead and looked at the whole document. Cool. And then I gave it over to Thomas to, uh, to look at. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's pointing this out. I've just been looking at this and it looks like diversity, equity, inclusion, and environmental justice is on the definitions twice. I don't know if anyone else noticed that, like maybe someone 
because I know it wasn't on there when I went to go look for it and maybe Morgan you started to write it and then like just didn't get to it or something but <laughs> I just wanted to quick quickly note that. So this is great and I really I appreciate seeing um, kind of all of all of you know what what everybody kind of came up with here and seeing all of the kind of proposed changes to simplify things to make it more readable kind of holistically as the whole bylaws um so i kind of have some maybe questions about next steps and procedures that i'd like to kind of figure out going forward with everybody on the call for now um, I think that there is a lot here and there's a bit here to digest even further. Um, obviously, I see some uh, comments um, that that are going to mean that, you know, the language may need to be adjusted in order to address some of some of the comments altogether. Um, one of the things that let me, I'm trying to kind of think. So one of the things that we could do, right? So one of the things that we are enabled to do kind of in this body and together, uh, part of the SAC on this call, is actually to go through and revise line by line until everybody feels like we've met consensus about the uh, whole bylaws document. I see that as one possible path forward for this evening um, to get to the point where the bylaws are passed. Um, I see another kind of viable path, which could be for um, two people to go ahead and take the document as it is with everybody's comments all together and to synthesize that document into one cohesive um, set of bylaws where some of the or not some of the but where like in track changes where the comments are um, are resolved and where the um, yep and, and where the changes are accepted um, in order to do that and to kind of work together to work through some of the issues in order to kind of commit to having sort of a, a holistic document at this time. Um, I'm just going to look to to you all to hear from you on on what your preference would be to to proceed on that. Stacy, certainly I can synthesize, accept changes and um, send out again at the end of this meeting, whatever uh, outcomes we have and uh, and then folks can maybe make some some final adjustments on their own individually and send it back to me um, that's one pathway um, but folks may want to just pick out a few things that are um, as you mentioned unresolved in, in the draft as it sits now tonight what if we what if we gave ourselves like 20 minutes of discussion around some of the open questions and then looked at where we're at. Yeah, I'm okay with that if others are as well. I think that sounds like a good idea to me. Another question too I was going to ask is, um, I don't know, I guess briefly how extensive our discussion on the comprehensive plan is as well. Just kind of wondering what else um, we need to cover tonight and how to spend our time. I think that's a great question. I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have an activity planned. Um, we haven't the the city's still developing some public in, engagement platforms and strategies um we i wanted to continue that in case we had some time tonight and probably won't um so that's an easy one to table so that would have just been more of like an update for for this evening rather than a planned activity so i don't think we'll spend some we'll we'll not spend any um significant time on that um, and I do want to save some time for um, a little bit extra around the conversation around language accessibility as well and, and documentation specifically and having things written down and translated. Okay. I, I have one other thought about, and, and like I said, like 20 minutes, but whatever amount makes sense to everybody, but maybe we could start with the comments before the edits? 
I agree with that and I was going to propose that path forward as well. <laughs> Does anybody else though have somewhere where like, no, I really want to start here. Like if I don't say this right now, if I don't get this out, then like, forget it. I'm going to be checked out of this process. Uh, maybe a philosophical thing to throw out there though. Um, yeah. It's kind of against the ideas of like whitewashing and greenwashing and things and um, I don't know I guess kind of the hollow symbols of stuff um, just I want to really I want to see these things get into action and things like the comprehensive plan and the climate action plan and like the budget and the funding and the activities we're doing are really important practical things and um, I mean, I'm new and I'm going with the flow but um, I just Want to throw out the philosophical question too on how much time we want to throw out of um, practical stuff to work on the wording of what we're going to do um, while we're going. Yeah, I think that that's um, something certainly to to consider that. Um, you know, we don't want to be spending the next five months squabbling over bylaws um, when there may be work to do. Understood. So I think, yeah, let's start with um, some of the comments that we have here. So I am trying, I have such a weird view of this on, on my screen. It's kind of hard to see a lot of it all at the same time. Um, Maybe you could have Scott read it and you could coordinate the conversation. Sure. Or a comment number one could be a group of people or someone not living in Urbana. That's related to for a citizen or it's been edited to for citizens slash public. Is there a specific question with that? That was my comment. Uh, I was just trying to reword it or trying to understand if a citizen is what we really mean or if we mean a, large, a group or someone that's not living here. Well, and citizen, typically we, we like to say resident because we're, we're serving everyone who lives here regardless of their citizenship status just to you know, be particular about words. What was the original? Was the original here still the um, Black Talk Citizens? It said citizen. Yeah. Provide a venue for citizens to give input. How about residents? Plural. So, so but does residents, and, and then maybe can we put a definition of res, residents up at the top? Because is the, SAC only interested or somehow restricted to only Urbana residents giving comments? Isn't it the greater public? Right. Anybody that wanted to make a comment at an SAC meeting is welcome to do that. It's an open and public meeting. You have to be a resident to be appointed. To be what? Appointed to the commission. So we could have a definition of residents. Uh, resident equals human living within the city, bound, the municipal boundaries or the city boundaries. Sure. I'm thinking ro robots all of a sudden. For some yeah. I was just think, thinking someone might come to a meeting and not be from Urbana but have some ideas. Right, but, but then the residence is just about who can be on it. Yeah. You have to be a resident. And then sure. you can also have a definition of the public, which is any person from anywhere. So in the context of the statement, this says other duties of the SAC may include providing a, and I don't remember if the word was venue here prior, but okay, provide, it was originally provide a venue for citizens. Basically this is public engagement, right? We're creating a public engagement statement that the SAC is a venue for public engagement um, for members of the public to give input and hear feedback on sustainability issues. It's less about um, the residents here, I think, is less about 
who can participate on the SAC, but rather how we're providing a platform or a place for, um, we can maybe just, I would say public engagement for input and feedback on sustainability issues. So we, yeah, that would be fine, yeah. So we had provide a place mm -hmm. and then we would say for the public to give input and hear feedback on sustainability issues. That works. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think engagement is on the side of being a bigger word when you just mean talk to us. Okay. Can you, can you repeat that, Morgan? Uh, we would replace citizens slash public with the public. Okay a place for the public to give input and hear feedback on sustainability issues. I was just trying to get at, it could be more than one person giving a statement or a comment, or it could be someone from out of town in the surrounding area that give a comment. I, I think that's encompassed by the public. Yeah. Um, so that, that makes anybody sense. can be a kind of a member of the public. And I think that that's good. I think that that may um, resolve that comment. And Scott, I don't know if you're actually able to or want to make like the active change and accept at um, this point. I can go to, uh, let me know what you see. I'm gonna try and go to the word. We're only seeing the PDF right now. Okay, no, give me one second. Hmm, hold on. Yep, no, I'm not going to be able to screen share across platforms here. So I'll just take notes. No worries. Oh, I see. You're not looking at that in a Google Doc. It's a PDF. Okay. All right. Um, all right. The next comment was... in section four on the heading commitment to support diversity equity inclusion and environmental justice in urbana's mission so the question is is should environmental um be removed from that uh heading i brought this up last time because i didn't like that the acronym didn't have the e <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can also, if, if justice is general, then environmental justice is included by implication. Uh, could we even have like environmental in parentheses or something? Um, as kind of like this is not part of the usual use of it, um, but for our purposes, like environmental justice is kind of like a targeted thing, particularly with sustainability. What if we said, I, I, I like your point about targeting it, but what if we said diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, especially in environmental, and especially the environmental aspects? Something to that effect. I just want to throw out something. I was at another, I was at a conference and they used, a, they switched around the acronym so they called it justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. So they called it a uh, Jedi. <laughs> and this was a, I guess it's a National Science Foundation conference. So that's what they used. So. I'm in favor of that. 
<laughs> but they didn't talk about it. Well, they didn't have environmental in there, so. But then it would fit at the beginning. So you'd have environmental justice, equity, <laughs> environmental Jedi. Can someone do a, a, a literature meta study to see which is most common in the literature? DEIJ or Jedi? So this person giving the presentation was a uh, diversity <laughs> officer. So I don't know. Well, there is a Jedi collaborative and the U.S. Climate Network also uses Jedi. It makes, it makes us, I mean, several people I know would smile when they hear that and smiling is good for us. Americansrails.org uses it. The I don't know what the IFAW is, but it's some legal group. They do that. Okay, yeah, so this exists. And I don't think that we would necessarily be plagiarizing it from one place if we decided to switch that wording around. Yeah, it was from the, this, I guess the, the title was the Jedi community or uh, collaborative. That's where this is coming from. I think especially if we have our definitions there at the beginning, because it looks like there's all sorts of different acronyms for or different words for the acronym Jedi and movies and stuff. But I think if we define it, um, that would be a fun one. Okay, is every is everybody liking on board? Does anyone have any questions or concerns about changing the order so that the acronym becomes Jedi? Because they're saying then it can be environmental Jedi and it doesn't mess up the acronym and still that targeted meaning. I agree. Let's sit with everybody. I got a thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. All right. All right. So this has become, Scott, the commitment to support environmental Jedi. Okay. Next comment um, is related to, oh boy, my eyes on this computer. Um, we will include, okay, so it's under number one, so 4.1. We will include diversity and equity provided in our programs and outreach efforts and goals. And the comment is, is I'm not very clear on this. There may be a clearer way to word this section. And while I'm looking at that and I just see a lot of things that are strike throughs, I, I tend to agree with this comment. <laughs> like I'm wondering, what are we trying to say here? So these comments, some of them would, be, would have been made without the benefit of other people's strike throughs and additions. Okay. Yeah, that was my comment, um, just looking at the original bylaws. I don't have much more to add. Just when I was reading it, I was like, oh, what do we mean? How so, I guess, in specific ways or races to that. Can I? I, I have the word version open with the simple markup so I could read that bullet number one the way it's currently written if the markup were all accepted. Go for it. Okay. The SAC is committed to growing and encouraging a culture of environmental Jedi. We value and celebrate the differences that make our community vibrant. Our diversity makes Urbana strong and more sustainable for all inhabitants. And, uh, yeah, sorry. 
At all times, the SAC will work towards equity in all we do. And then this last sentence is a little mixed up. We will include diversity and equity is provided in all our programs and outreach efforts. And I wasn't, I, I didn't understand, is this just, Grace, you said that was your comment. Was it sort of about just the end or that whole section? I think just about the end and not even, um, I think just in the original one too. So the original one, just that last part of the sentence, integrating our commitment to diversity and inclusion into our commission programs and outreach efforts and goals. And I, just as I was reading, I was wondering if there was like a clearer or more targeted way to say that. Not a minor point, so if it's nothing you want to spend time on, that's fine. Are we not I wonder if the last sentence is not necessary. Like we could, like, because the sentence right before it says, at all times, the SAC will work towards equity in all we do. Period. So then do we even need that sort of programs and goals? I'm not sure that, that that's needed anymore um, in the original document that you were working off of um, where, where Grace had read that. Um, I, the way that that was written, I was kind of thinking about things from a, um, from the standpoint that we, we, we kind of, we have different, we support different programs in in the city so like some programs that we kind of like support for example that i think about and i don't mean financial support but things that we like we talk about it we invite people here to talk to us about it we put on some workshops um maybe around solar stuff right it may be around um the uh, pesticide free lawns um and pesticide free kind of herbicide free pesticide yeah um lawn program and so the, I think the point that I was getting at with, with that last sentence um, was that we would consider environmental justice and the aspects of that program when we talk about like accessibility for, um, accessibility for folks to either, you know, uh, join and come to a meeting, for example, or, be able to access a program or even if they learn something new and they want to have resources like but they don't have the resources how are we going to talk about how the program is equitably distributed so that somebody that may be um, of lower resources can achieve the same benefit but maybe without the same pay you know having to pay in some way and so anyway, so I'm kind of just trying to think about like, all right, so these are the types of things that I want to be thinking about and considering when we're talking about the um, programs that we're considering and not just give that blanket like, oh yeah, you know, we think everyone should have sunflowers in their yard, for example, so everybody should come and buy seeds from us. Like we have to come up with a better way to make that a more fair and equitable program. Does that kind of make sense? It makes sense, but I, I guess I'm not following how it translates to what's in the bylaws. <laughs> um, sure. So can you read what that original statement was, Grace, again? Uh, yes. Uh, just you want the last uh, part of the sentence? Yeah. So the SAC will work towards equity in all we do by building and integrating our commitment to diversity and inclusion into our commission program and outreach efforts and goals. Could I suggest that we include the specifics related to this like the component of 
we're going to do this. Here are some specific ways we're going to do it. Instead of having it in number one, where it is this last sentence, it could be added as one of the bullets in number three, where we like highlight. So for one thing is review all outreach programs to, from, from the perspective of uh, equity and accessibility. Like have a, have a checkpoint in our process that is, did we cover this? Did we look at that? That's an idea. So I'm kind of in favor of striking the last sentence from that bullet point number one as it is right now. I'm not sure that it's needed. And then I also, um, I'm willing to kind of talk about where these, the, the how to kind of statements or the what we'll do may fit under bullet point three. Are others comfortable with that? Okay, great. The next bullet point is related to um, number three bullet point two so promote diversity among sac members board and staff okay so provide diversity among sac members build long-term relationships with underrepresented communities to listen and address needs identified by the communities and then maybe increase capacity for establishing partnerships with diverse and underserved communities um, Okay, so I would think it was the numbers two and three, the second and third bullet points that seem similar. I have a very poor understanding of the concept of increased capacity. Does it mean, does it mean our abilities, like strengthen our abilities to do something? What, what is increased capacity? How, how, how does that apply? Just what's the phrase mean? <laughs> That's what I was wondering as well. Um, it seems like, and if we have a limited capacity, why is that and how would we increase it? Um, I'm definitely unclear on that one as well. Um, in my comments, I had recommended just taking that out and just say increase partnerships with diverse and underserved communities. Um, but it, yeah, I do think that two and three seem really similar to build long-term relationships and increase partnerships. Uh, if there is a distinct difference between those, I think that's totally cool. I was just not sure um, what that was. And yeah, also I'm confused on the capacity part. Sure. So I think that I can speak to the capacity part, um, whether or not the two sentences are, are similar enough and that we want to shorten one or kind of combine them both um, up for discussion for sure. And I'm open for that. Um, the capacity piece, I think, is sort of interesting, and I rely back on. Huh, I rely back on this on, on my AmeriCorps days when I was an AmeriCorps member, and it's like the mission of AmeriCorps Vistas to help build capacity in their community or help build capacity with the organizations that they're working for. And let me not just give the um, you know definition of a word with the word itself so I realize I'm doing that um, so functionally the way that that sort of works where I where I was at in the community that I was working in is that I was an AmeriCorps Vista in a extremely rural community um, and and in that extremely rural community I was tasked with being an energy efficiency coordinator for that small for that small area and and the kind of areas surrounding it and where um, you know first of all I was in a community that basically I, I was doing a lot of education rural outreach on on energy efficiency specifically but there was also this idea that with the work involved was that I was 
um, and others who had other jobs doing different things, not just energy efficiency, but we had like an agricultural program and we also had someone who was working on um, broadband and broadband access was really learning the resources of the community that had existed um, that perhaps residents didn't really know about and didn't know how to access and that maybe these resources weren't talking to each other either and that they didn't know that each other had existed so that building these relationships in a way building partnerships in a way so that all of these different groups could come together to sort of effectively change something about the community for the better in a certain way and so when i think of building capacity i think of um I, I do, I think of organizing in a way. I think of um, basically Connecting. creating pathways that hadn't existed previously in order to affect some change that we want to see. So it's like the, the structure, it's like, it's like creating a robust structure that allows blossoming and growth of the projects. It's a, putting yeah. it my way. <laughs> right, it, it creates the space for, um, it creates the space for people to kind of share and create a vision together. So I, I would say that's different than building long-term relationships. Because just philosophically, I would think that there's the there's having the connection allows us to um, communicate better, right? The relationships are listening and hearing and exchanging ideas in many ways and being supportive, like relating. While the building capacity is more, seems like it's more in the, in the zone of um, providing opportunities, um, educating on like what what is green infrastructure things like that um, it's like communicating and then i just before i stop i i feel like there's a a, a clarification about relationships versus partnerships there's a partnership whether it's a collaboration and an e or an equal partnership that implies everybody's doing something or you know both sides or multiple pieces of multiple groups are actively engaged and the relationships might be more um a conversation where that conversation's active but then it's not it's like it might be a one-off thing um, it happens sporadically so i i do think i mean we could we could make it one line as far as relationships and partnerships, but I would keep them, I'd keep, I would keep both words. Yes. From the terminology perspective, I wonder if we could find a different way to phrase the capacity concept. Hmm. You could, um, you help me understand even better do you have maybe like an example we can think of how the SAC has or would um, increase that capacity for partnerships? Are there, I, I, I guess I want to kind of ask members of the SAC before I jump in with kind of just any ideas that I have on that, but ways that um, other members of the SAC could could see that playing out. Um, honestly, I think my internet cut out for a second, so I didn't really hear the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> Oh yeah, no problem. I was just trying to have a better understanding of building this capacity for partnerships and especially being new to the SAC, I'm kind of wrapping my head around the whole organization and the bylaws and the plan. And so I'm definitely learning a lot here. 
Um, so I was wondering if um, you all could think of any examples of how the SAC has or could build this capacity for partnerships. Well, I think so. I have sort of like a concrete example that I can draw on, um, and this is at least on the establishing partnership side. Um, and Andy, I'm, I'm gonna kind of pick on you a, a little bit in a really nice way. Um, recently, and over the last couple of years, with, um, for example, the uh, geothermal projects, right? So. Um, Andy had this idea that, you know, for the last several years, we have a program on um, incentivizing solar that, that we run, um, the, or like at solar 4.0 or solar 5.0 now, I, I have a hard time keeping track, so solar 5.0, so it's the fifth year of the program that's been incredibly successful. And um, so I think, you know, I could use kind of the capacity language um, and you set out to build the capacity for, well, how can we do some kind of similar program? We see a lot of successes with this. Um, what about with, with geothermal? Could we create a program in this geothermal area? And so through, um, through his work and setting up meetings with, um, us on the council, as well as um, meetings with the Midwest Renewable Energy Association and the Geothermal Association. And, um, just for an outsider's view, because I have an outsider's view of this, what it looks like is that, um, through, that through that energy, through that proposal, that we now have a new path that hadn't existed before that, you know, that would not have necessarily and most likely would not have come around if it wasn't um, because of the own initiative that, that Andy has taken in this area. Um, so I think that capacity building can be through individual SAC member initiative um, for certain. Um, and another area could also be um, kind of like, I don't know, I, I don't know that we are going to have necessarily like an AmeriCorps program here, but we could explore that. We can explore having an AmeriCorps program. We can explore having um, interns um, or internships at the city whose role is to kind of focus on, to focus on these aspects. Um, I, I don't see this as, as limiting um, or I don't see this as myself wanting to kind of limit what the opportunities are and what we necessarily lock ourselves into, but to kind of work creatively and to use our imaginations to, um, to, to kind of work on this collaboratively and together. So first thing, it was actually Scott that pushed the, <laughs> the geothermal program. He did all the, he did all the work with John. Um, capacity, I think the word mean for me it means that the city has the the tools and the the structure and the mission to do things that other groups don't have. So. It's like the university has expertise and capacity and just size and whatever to do things. The city has that same um, capability comparable to nonprofit groups, uh, systems themselves. So they have, they have that strength there or that structure to carry out some programs that wouldn't necessarily happen. That's where I see the word capacity. Thank you for clarifying. I was wondering if you had anything else to add too about how that applies to diverse and underserved communities. Um, well, there's probably things that other groups can't do and the city can do in regards to those groups. Um, like with the geothermal example, I was wondering if there was any like intentionality of 
reaching out to other groups or building that because I mean if we're talking about here partnerships with diverse and underserved communities and yeah. the well, energy center is a great organization but I don't know if they would fall under that category or if there's anything outside of that that was kind of an intentional thing to bring this in mm. members if if this commission can't figure out what capacity means that that might be a good sign that it fails the common language test Dad, I thought you were going to talk about how the Illinois Solar for All is a component, an aspect of what SAC, well, you have done to connect with the um, underserved populations. Can you go over that? Please? Sure. Um, our, our landfill solar development uh, won state incentives for a uh, uh, low income and it's more like low and moderate income community solar array uh, this is part of the illinois solar for all program which is expanding access to renewable energy um, to a broader section of, of residents in illinois will that do it Maybe. See, the other, I guess the other way of rephrasing that statement would actually be to include, like, instead of saying increased capacity, would be increase the city's capacity because our, the SAC brings expertise and people together that don't, the city doesn't necessarily have by themselves. So the SAC themselves is bringing the capacity to the city as, pers as people as ex ex expert as, as uh, residents. I don't know if that was what the statement was trying to get at necessarily, but. So I sort of, I sort of wonder if we're even allowed to sort of make statements that are like, that impact the city as a whole rather than can impact the work that we do as as the SAC. So, you know, could we say something like increase the city's capacity in this context? Would that be acceptable? Well, I think bylaws are primarily about how the public body operates, does its business internally. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that, I mean, clearly the purpose of the commission is to uh, as the uh, enabling ordinance says, something to the effect of um, you know, provide information or give feedback or some such turn of phrase to the city or city council or whatever it may be. Um, so it's not that you know this is completely separate from this, but the, I think the bylaws are a little more about you know the goals, aspirations, and workings of the commission specifically rather than the city. So one thing that I noticed is that there hasn't been a lot of um, question or debate around the second bullet point, but there is a bit of um, a, a inconclusivity around, around that third bullet point. And I'm wondering what it, I'm wondering two things. One, should that third bullet point be erased and we leave this as building relationships is something we want to do as satisfactory? Um, or what language needs to change um, in order for everybody to feel comfortable with leaving uh, the third bullet point in? So, um, I think that the, uh, I would be comfortable just deleting the third bullet point um, because the concept of increasing capacity from the way you've described it fits the definition of building relationships. 
uh, to me. Um, I, um, so my recommendations were to keep them both, but just um, get rid of the word capacity. So just increase our partnerships and build long-term relationships. I think that those um, definitely can be distinct, just kind of depending on how we're defining them or using those langu that language. Um, and I definitely hear what you're saying with capacity, but I think, yeah, it may be something that's not as familiar uh, with the general public or what that means in this context. Sure. Yeah, if we wanted to combine two and three, then I would move the word partnerships up to two and add that after relationships. So you cover both. So like build long-term relationships and establish partnerships with underrepresented communities, dot, dot, dot. Because relationships is kind of informal or a partnership it's kind of more formal. There might be a, some kind of contractual, some kind of um, something formed in a formally, a formal agreement, I guess, where a, a relationship can just be a relationship. There's no, there's no uh, outcome necessarily in play. like that. So I'm just looking. So Scott, if you were going to make changes to this document based on our conversation that we've had so far, um, would you know what you were writing? Yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes. Okay, so you actually, so you feel clear on combining both and that makes sense? Okay, all right. Morgan, I'm sorry, I might have cut you off there. No, we're good. I said I like that. Okay. I will, I will point out, um, I had suggested 20 minutes and we're coming up on 40. I don't, I mean, just because I'd said that, I feel like I need to point it out. But I'm okay continuing myself. There aren't that many more comments to address left. Um, so if everybody would be comfortable with just uh, the last two, really, would that be okay? Okay. Um, so the next comment is integrating JEDI into setting the priorities of the commission and its organizational operations. And uh, the question is, is, does this include city comp plan? If so, include that. I think not. I agree that probably not as well. Um, how about, uh, about those? Oh, that's next. I'll save it for the next point. Sorry. Okay. And then the next point was on setting Jedi goals that are actionable and measurable. And then I, I think Grace, I hear Grace, was that your comment? When will we set these and how do we share them? Yeah, and I think that was also part of my previous comment of the comprehensive plan is uh, will these goals that are actionable and measurable and we'll evaluate and share, how will we share those? And is that part of the plan or just kind of where does that fall? So this is one of the things that's obviously open to interpretation by the um, by the existing board from now that as well moves into the future that may be made up of um, a makeup of people that's very different from us and so it will be up to them as it is also up to us in order to set these goals that would be actionable and measurable um, so what I would look for from this would be for members of the commission, your um, members are able, um, allowed, permitted, I don't know what the right word is or phrase here, to um, actually help to help craft this for, for this body. Um, I can do some of that work in, 
ensuring that we have like an agenda item, for example, on the agenda that says that, okay, we're going to talk about Jedi stuff. Um, but to come up with that kind of concrete and um, actionable, measurable, specific goals for goal setting, I would like to hear from each of you through this process, um, kind of maybe, you know, after we move through bylaw setting, um, for, for what your ideas are and for how you would like that process to go. now grace you're on mute but i just wanted to give you a chance to respond oh um i don't know yeah i'm still wondering the question myself it seems like the comprehensive plan could be a place to start and even when we're looking at um budgeting as a whole and all sorts of things especially if we really want to inc include these jedi goals is there something about police budgets or training or having more equitable child arrests or any kind of concrete things and how does that fall into an incorporation also, I'm just kind of wondering our general relationship to the city and city council and kind of where our commission's input comes into play and when that happens. I think those would be too specific for bylaws. Um, those, you know, this is more about um, how, the, you know, how the commission works and what its core values are um, rather than interpreting how those play out as policy. In terms of how the commission relates to city council, I would refer to the the enabling ordinance. Um, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's it it, it is essentially um, that the commission informs and suggests and recommends and gives advice to mayor and council. As a practical matter, um, the commission also does all those things uh, for staff. Um, suggests, recommends, gives advice, informs staff as well uh, as mayor and council. Yeah, and I understand that's beyond the scope of the bylaws, but it seems like if we're including it in the bylaws, uh, it seems to make sense to have a plan on how we would execute these bylaws. So I guess outside the bylaws, just kind of where these actionable, measurable goals will be and our evaluation and reporting outside of the bylaws. Uh, comment on that. So with the, in order to set good environmental JEDI goals, we can't do it on our own. We have to do it by listening and, and reaching out and asking the question of what the goals should be for the, um, the groups in our community that we are trying to support. So it, it's very much going to them and asking, and I say them, so it becomes who are they and how do we reach them and, and how do we encourage those connections and create them? Can we find some? Are there some already existing? Uh, so there's, I think the first phase, if we were doing it outside of the city's comprehensive plan, then we'd have to get into how can we find the people and reach out to the whole community. I think with the city's comprehensive city, is it comprehensive city plan? Scott, is that the phrase? I call it comprehensive city plan to yeah. try and distinguish between a comprehensive language. Yeah. So with the comprehensive city plan that's underway, there will be a lot of that engagement and, and conversation that we can perhaps tag on to or request that the city include these some questions from our from the environmental sustainability perspective to lead into the goals that we would be working towards and supporting. Yeah, thanks for the input. And I guess also another philosophical question on just how we'll execute these things. I wouldn't, I think these are great ideas and it would be a shame if they sit in our bylaws and don't um, get lived out. 
Sure. Yeah, I think in the past, you know, we would we would translate big picture, you know, principles into the climate action plan, the water management plan. Those are phasing out. Now our, our plan uh, elements are going to be in the comprehensive city plan. So in terms of um, goals and activities, um, we would we would push the those into the comprehensive plan. And I'm sorry, I keep bringing it up, and it seems like it never. It never really arrives in terms of public engagement because of the, you know, social distancing. Staff uh, is spending a lot more time, and actually, it was, I think it's going to be a, a real benefit being very um, attentive to the public engagement process because we can't just, you know, um, open up the civic center and hope people show up. We have to be a lot more intentional now, and so they're they're spending a lot of time. Um, exploring different, uh, you know, platforms and considering how we're going to reach folks and, and, and get get them access to the, the public engagement process. So it is coming, uh, and I'm sorry I keep bringing it up without ever really um, bringing it forward. I could share some examples. So in the transportation side, um, when I was on the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission and I was a transportation coordinator on campus, uh, we were going through the same questions. How do, we, how do we communicate with people who have historically been underrepresented, which means they're not already sitting around coming to the commission meetings, right? So how do we, how do we build that connection? And um, the Regional Planning Commission did this amazing job where they, they partnered with the Mass Transit District and um, because a public input session is normally at a location and we expect the town to come to us to like look at uh, the plans and, and conversation. Well, what they did in this situation was they built the, uh, they, they established the input session inside a bus and took the bus to different neighborhoods. Um, so that, that was one pathway forward. And the other thing, um, Grace, I really like how you keep saying, how are we going to act on it? Yes, yes, this is about action. This is not about talk. We are going to act. And you're surrounded by a bunch of actors, and we're happy to have you help us and put the pressure on. Cool. I like it. Awesome. Thank you. And I always mean it in the most constructive ways possible. It's good to me. Great, okay. Um, thank you for everybody for participating kind of in this conversation um, this evening. And our next steps are the way that I understand it, although I don't know that it was specifically decided on, um, was that we would have Scott take these um, proposed changes and create a single document from that. Um, and then send that back out to everybody if there are any specific comments to clean up anything um, kind of, you know, after, after this discussion and after he sends that out, um, then for you to individually send that back to him. Um, does everybody agree with that process? Yes, are we, are we asking Scott to try to answer like to go ahead and tweak things himself or, uh, well, just uh, the last bullet under number three has a bunch of question marks in it. Nope, oh, can you go back to all these? You were right and I'm sorry, maybe I should have been having this conversation after we got to the kind of unfinished business item, but I think that we're actually there. So that last bullet point says to promote and enact translation of important public facing documents into multiple languages um, and to recommend that city council, recommend to city council that translation services are available for boards and commissions with some additional questions. Um, I am inclined toward well i don't really know so yeah i let me let me just put it like let me ask a question um 
we had a conversation last month about about translation and translation services and we do want to kind of continue that conversation a little bit here tonight um so maybe yeah, i'm going to kind of combine that conversation now at this point and then after that i'll ask everybody if they're comfortable with having scott um compile what we've discussed as well as accept changes make formatting changes that make grammar correct and things like that so about these translation services um i think this is a very interesting idea for promoting enacting translation of our public facing documents into multiple languages um it's not something that i have observed us doing in in my sort of tenure here, um, I see it as a definitely a recommendation to city council that it's something that we're interested in and want to see more of from the city to make a city more inclusive. Um, does that belong in in the bylaws here? I think the first sentence could could stay because it will you know it would always be relevant, but the second sentence recommend that's sort of a one and done. Like once you've recommended, it doesn't need to be there anymore. It's not about the, the ongoing operations of the of the commission. It could become uh, an SAC resolution uh, recommending to city council to do this or that. I agree. I'd like to have us pursue a recommendation, uh, but I think only the first bullet, the first sentence of the last bullet is what fits into bylaws, which is to promote and enact translation of important public facing documents into multiple languages. Um, if I could add, can I jump to the unfinished business because it seems relevant here and it's not really long. Yeah, no, of course. Go right ahead. It seems like actually on the city website, they already have, um, it looks like almost everything in Spanish, French, I'm guessing Mandarin and Korean um, in the native language, and I don't speak either of those and can't read them, so I'm not sure. But just on any of the city of Urbana website up in the top um, left, like the top bar, and I've played around with it in Spanish and it seems to be pretty accurate. And even when you open up individual documents, a lot of them are translated as well. Um, and I was also looking at Facebook and talking with Megan on this point. And on Facebook, there are settings to automatically translate any text post. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Like if we did a, a photo or, you know, some kind of graphic document to maybe have that available in multiple languages or just stick to text announcements on Facebook. And on the user end, you can have Facebook automatically translate the posts that you see. And it looks like on the organization end, there's some function where you can enable that automatic translation of your text posts into whatever someone has set as their native language on Facebook. And I was trying to look at our SAC page in particular, and when I click to Spanish on our page in particular, it just takes me back to the main page, and I'm not able to find it again. Um, I guess I didn't look at our page in particular. It looks like a lot of the main city resources were translated, um, but for some reason, I can't like search within the website while it's translated. Oh, no, I can. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, but anyway, that just seemed um, encouraging that there was already a lot of stuff available and it could maybe be expanded to other languages. Um, and so something uh, in that sense that I don't know if is necessary in the bylaws or kind of like support that we continue to do this or continue to make our conversations accessible for people of different languages or reading ability or location or whatever it may be kind of like general accessibility. Like you said, with the bus going there, or maybe we could continue to do things on Zoom, even when we're in person, if being in that location at a time is a problem. Um, just those kinds of things about general sustainability or accessibility.
I got distracted while playing around with this. I, I just got excited about seeing the translations that are available. Oh, there it is. There's and that. while Scott was able to pull that up, what is interesting is that I was not able to on my computer just now. It took me also back to the homepage. Yeah, I'm not. So, it took me back to the homepage, and I just used the link to navigate to the sustainability board page. While you were in the Spanish language already. Right. So right. kind of a user education situation here. Okay. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of technology with the automatic translations, which in the past um, I haven't found to be very accurate. Um, but what I have looked around, at least on Spanish, looks pretty accurate translation to me. I can't speak for any of the other languages all of the documents, but it was nice to see that that function seems to work pretty well. And I opened up quite a few documents and it automatically translated the documents themselves. I would recommend that we don't edit the bylaws for that point because it, we don't have to delineate everything in the bylaws that we're gonna do as long as what we're doing follows the, the core concepts. And this, you know, we're striving to do these things, that doesn't mean we're not striving to do other things, right? So it's okay if it doesn't, if it's not all inclusive. Um, so I personally would like to let the bylaws move along the way they are and recognize that accessibility is a key component of um, environmental JEDIs and multiple languages and, and multiple reading levels and multiple um, abilities. Do we need an accessibility type statement? And I think it's the law anyway. <laughs> I think that would be more relevant than having something specific to language exclusively if we did want to have that route. I think going with general accessibility with the things that we're bound to by law and other things that we may feel that go above and beyond that, that we want to try and do as well. And I'm fine either way. I don't know if that has a place in the bylaws or not, but I think general accessibility may be more appropriate than specifically language accessibility alone. Do you want to recommend a way to, to add it? Like what a bullet point might be about We're going to add one. Or if you know how you could add that statement. I think if we wanted to, just something along the lines of, you know, promote accessibility by providing media in multiple language, you know, advertising our time of regular meetings, trying to make that accessible on the internet remotely, or I don't know. I mean, I did, doesn't so, the first sentence do that? If you take out the recommend, which, which we talked about as a little more one and done. It specifically says languages. Translation of important public piece. You mean the first sentence of that bullet point? Correct, yeah, I mean, that, that seems to work. I mean, feel free to rewrite it, don't, if, if you have a better turn of phrase. It seems like that is talking about languages specifically. Yeah, Grace, you're referring to not just languages, but also what hearing impaired and yeah, yeah. Every, everything else is law is already in the law. Hearing impaired, um, you know, the physical ab uh, ability to enter buildings, it's all in the law. I also sort of wonder if. You know, when we're talking about, when we are talking about goals um, kind of down the line and in the future, and when we're really digging in on what like Jedi means to us, I, I see this conversation as really situated under inclusiveness and under inclusivity and how we do that, how we do inclusion. And so I kind of see it encompassed um, as part of that. I, I don't... Um, Mm, it, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, I, I think it's a great conversation, um, but I, I do, I, I see this as part of inclusion. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it could be worth mentioning, you know, general inclusion as far as languages and the other things we're legally obligated to do or may choose to do additionally. Um, and even if it's something that we already have, but maybe in that language, like continue to promote and support inclusivity in the city by publicizing media in multiple languages and continuing to follow legal requirements of general accessibility, something along those lines. I support that. I, I think that having it as its own bullet though, like have the languages one and have another bullet that's about accessibility. But to highlight that it's something that we recognize as an issue. Mm -hmm. I think we have great services there now, but it is still not in, I mean, every fathomable language or accessibility thing. I think they've been doing stuff in Konku Ball, which I'm not sure um, how that translate in, translates in writing, but like for coronavirus updates, they've been doing, um, you know, spoken updates to share with the community. Um, so I think that there's still things that we could include. We only have four languages and Megan was talking about all sorts of more. Um, so maybe something along the lines continue and expand our inclusivity maybe. Trying to think of a way to word it. Um, I almost want to think on it just a little bit more, but does anybody have a way to kind of succinctly um, I like the idea that we're not finished with this. Like we're continually striving to be better, or striving to get something further, I guess. Yeah. Just to make I wondered who his doorbell it was. <laughs> I suggest we, we move on to the next agenda item before it gets to be nine o'clock. So, because we have to circle back to this next time anyway. Right? We do have to circle back to this, and maybe that's the place where we end up before the vote next time, since I don't believe that we're going to vote on the bylaws this evening. It's just not finished enough for us to do that. Um, I agree, maybe we circle back to that, and that's like just the last point where we may vote on bylaws with amendments related to this last issue. If folks want to send me, not each other, but send me um, their, their proposed sentence for that, I can compile. Um, can I throw out two last minute thoughts? Yeah. I'll send this to Scott also, but um, for me and what I teach on sustainability, I really focus on those three pillars of economic, social, and environmental well-being. And I, um, I'd put that in the notes to send to Scott, but I think that's something that for me is important to add into that definition and into the things that we do, kind of looking at those areas in particular. Um, and I also kind of Go back to our uh, actionable and measurable goals and how we report and share those and it sounds like that is still open for discussion and we don't have a set plan on that and that's something that we'll also think of is that correct i believe so yeah mm -hmm. okay um, so I just, I wanted to just sort of, Scott, can you scroll that back to the top, please? Where we have the definition that was added of sustainability, how the city of Urbana defines sustainability as progress meeting the needs, et cetera, et cetera. We may need to go back and take a look at the um, original a document that started the Sustainability Commission, just to make sure that that's in line. And then we might um, consider adding a note about the three pillars. I think that 
there is definitely kind of the two definitions, kind of two standard definitions of sustainability and the three pillar definition is also one that um, I think that, you know, we address here at the SAC. It's also taught, I think, kind of in classes at U of I as well. I'll check that. Okay, thank you. All right, so Morgan, I know that you had some, like, should we move on or should we move on to the next agenda item? What I would like to just tell folks is that um, on the agenda next was for us to review anything that we had to review with the comprehensive plan um, for this evening. I don't believe that there is any further discussion on comp plan. Is that right, Scott, just for tonight? But we're leaving it in the agenda for future meetings as that placeholder because we will be having these conversations. And as Scott had explained um, with like, staff being careful and being um, uh, thoughtful on how to really engage the public on, on the comp plan right now, especially right now with COVID. So, so we will get there. Uh, we just don't have anything on that this evening. Um, we have addressed the language, have we addressed or fully addressed the language and accessibility uh, topic, Grace, that you had wanted to bring up? Uh, yes, that was all that I had wanted to share on that note. Uh, and can we have questions about the comprehensive plan? Yeah, yeah, we could go back and ask some questions on that. Absolutely. I'm just still trying to wrap my head around all sorts of things. Um, so I was wondering if there's like a, a deadline for this new plan and what's the time period of the new plan? Is it for another 15 years or is it set to be revised sooner? Um, is kind of what's the current status and when is this input? Um, welcomed or possible and kind of what is SAC's role in that plan, especially since we're combining it with the climate action and water plans now. There is a, a graphic, let me see if it's on the city website. Um, I, I put it in SAC packet, I think last month, um, that, that shows a roadmap of the comprehensive plan. Uh, give me one second, just see if it's on the city website. Um, there's no, there's no deadline to finish it, um, but, but staff is working, here it is. And then switch, oh, here we go. You all see that? Yes. So there, there's no deadline to finish it. It's not a legally required document that we owe the state or anything. Um, we it, had there not been coronavirus we would already be doing in-person public engagement by this point um, what i can tell you is um, this is not a city staff write the whole thing and then ask people what they think um, we're going to be starting with public engagement long before there's a whole lot put together um, staff is working to create some uh, just enough information to get some conversations going and get some feedback from the public in terms of big picture values themes and then that'll drill down into more specific um, plans and activities. Would you say that they're in the just step two the determined framework and stakeholders? Yes. And generally for people who haven't gone through plans, I mean, these typically take six to 12 months, sometimes 18 months. This is two years. This is two years, okay. Sorry, I missed that. So we're in the second part of a like 10 part thing. <laughs> it's gonna take two years. Okay. And, and part of what, could we do some, could we do some uh, identifying sustainability stakeholders and there's there's community stakeholders at large that are all stakeholders in how how sustainable our town is but there are contacts that are sustainability so I've I've done a lot of that work but I, there are certainly you know folks I've probably missed and you are absolutely welcome to email those contacts to myself or um, to Andrea Ruedi, if you happen to have her email on the city website. 
But if you email it to me, I will forward it to them. Or could you share what you, I mean, do you have it as like a document somewhere that you could share? I don't have it anymore. I, I've just given it. Just for you. Yeah. It just, and just a reminder, Andrea Ruedi is, is, um, is, what's the word, Gui guiding this effort, uh, guiding city staff and, and the public through this, this road. road. And Scott, remind me when she gave us her presentation. Um, that was probably three or four months ago. Okay. So that had the roadmap in it, remember that was. So when does um, public or SAC input come in? So um, the, the public and the SAC will start public engagement, start participating as soon as staff can get a public, a digital public engagement platform up and running. Um, I say digital, they may have printouts available too that, um, that maybe folks are gonna write on. I'm not privy to those conversations. Um, but they're, they're, they're working to, to develop a public engagement platform or platforms. Is that in, at any particular step or just whenever they can? Tell me more about what you mean. Like in this roadmap, is there a particular place that public input or SAC input comes into place? So um, that'll be this section here, determine framework and stakeholders. And then there's probably gonna be, um, yeah, there's another opportunity hardwired in here, community feedback. Um, but there's probably gonna be more than two iterations. It's probably gonna be a more of a, a constant process of public engagement, but there's certainly two, two uh, mentions of it in here. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, from my experience with sustainability or like lead green building stuff, they say the design part is the most important and getting that stakeholder input earlier on. And so that sounds great that there's a few opportunities for that as kind of the initial brainstorming and then here's a draft, what do you actually think of it? Yeah. I think this could be another great opportunity for us to think about our environmental Jedi stuff. And I think that there is definitely value for using our personal networks. And I think there's also lots of things outside of our personal networks that we can try and expand upon. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I was wondering if there's anything from SAC in particular, like we talked, um, sounds like asking about what's our relationship with city council is that we bring recommendations to them. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything that you know, we have recommended or would recommend, or especially in light of our new bylaws, um, if there's any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think that, that this is something that I think is evolved and evolving kind of in the present moment and towards the future as well. Um, something that is in the uh, sort of creating the documents that created the SAC is, um, let me find it here because I think it really speaks to when the SAC was was created and its purpose um, is the ordinance establishing. So in that ordinance establishing um, what we work on, the purpose of the commission, so this is a quote from that document, the purpose of the commission shall be to assist the mayor and city council in identifying the highest priorities for city government and citizens to achieve sustainable management of natural resources, water and energy in particular, and shall recommend to the mayor and city council goals to achieve and workable means to reach such goals. So there is a piece to this, which is assistive. So if the mayor or city council member um, has, a, has something that they want the SAC to work on, um, they would likely 
go to Scott um, or they may reach out to me or another member potentially of the SAC and ask for ask for kind of advice in this. Um, the other piece is in recommendations, um, making recommendations to mayor and city council and goals to achieve in the workable means. So what we work on together, whether or not the, whether or not the mayor and city council maybe has made a direct request of us, um, we can have conversations as part of the SAC around um, sustainability goals. Now here, obviously they talked about it being mostly just on water and energy in particular. I think that we take a more holistic view of sustainability and environmentalism to be certainly more inclusive than just simply water and energy. Um, and so when we have um, conversations uh, as part of the SAC when we are when we invite speakers to come and speak with us um, when there's something programmatic that comes out of that or something that, that we're interested in seeing programmatically happen or some sort of advocacy type work that we want to do we want to advocate for a certain position um, I believe that this enables us to um, identify those priorities and to bring those up with the mayor and city council in um, in a manner that is I mean it doesn't say I don't know if it actually says I wanted to go down here and see if it said in a way how to specifically do that um, it doesn't it doesn't say specifically how we would do that um, so that we could kind of we can contact members of the city council we can contact the mayor's office to make said recommendations. Um, obviously, there's no impetus written here. One of the things that um, I think about and, and notice that says, you know, we help identify priorities, but we're not setting policy. This does not indicate that we are setting policy specifically. So we can govern ourselves, we can govern ourselves through our bylaws, we can govern ourselves through our goals and resolutions. Um, but that is not that that isn't binding for the for the entire city. Yeah, I like the addition of the bylaws to expand it beyond water and energy and natural resources and that for me, I think those three pillars of sustainability are essential. And if we're missing the social piece and we let environmental racism continue in our community, then that's not part of a sustainable community. It's my understanding that the Fifth and Hill community still hasn't been properly cleaned up for residential standards, that there are still, there's still inequitable funding on some of our roads and sidewalks. And I think that there are a lot of things in our community that we could address or point out as some of those priorities, especially if we're making it a point to include environmental Jedi in our goals and bylaws. I really look forward to working with you, Grace, on identifying some of these community issues that you've brought up um, this evening to see how we may be able to listen and address. So kind of just echoing on, on Morgan's, thank you. Thank you for your presence and for the insights that you're bringing to the commission. I appreciate the listening and support um, and it sounds like that's what we're working on with the bylaws is getting more of input. Um, I've reached out to a few groups kind of trying to rope in some of this. I think there are lots of speakers that we could have if that's an interest and again just wondering ultimately how that gets into anything actionable in the city from this commission up towards other city things. I understand we don't directly make policy but I'm wondering how and if we make recommendations to the city and how that works. So one of the recommendations we made was to, um, and I'm sorry, I can't quote it. <laughs> so remember it was a very big discussion, but it was to sign on or to modify the city goal. Um, Scott, you were there, Andy, I think you were, but it may have been, have been before Stacy joined was the um, the 2040 
the clean power by 2040, 100% clean energy by 2040, I think is what it was. Mm -hmm. so, I met our youth uh, climate resolution. So we passed a resolution that the, not a resolution, we made a recommendation that the city um, update their, the climate goals for the city of Urbana, and they did. Um, so that's one of the things that we did. Uh, we also, there's, there's so much, um, it's really an, un, there, there's, there's this unsung hero who does not get, you, know, you hear like a little bit from us about Scott doing so much stuff, but the, the whole solar Urbana champagne um, was really one of his brainchilds. He got a grant, he found partners, he developed this program. The very first year that it went out, um, we had more met more kilowatt hours of solar energy installed in Champaign County than Chicago had when they ran the program and not normalized by population. And that was year one. And we did it again and again, he, and again, and now we're in the fifth round of that and expanding into geothermal. Also, all of that is sort of the, um, Middle class public, and I mean, I'm just it doesn't get into how do you get clean energy into low income areas or um, places that are uh, historically underrepresented. And so he pursued the Solar for All program and has made a significant change with that. There's also the compost pro projects um, set selling compost bins and rain barrels is uh, launched through the, it's not through the commission per se, but we're in many ways guiding um, or answering questions, I think, and what Scott's trying to do. And he has launched a lot of these programs because of the climate action plans that were put together through this commission. So there's, I just, I, I want to absolutely assure you that the bylaws thing, it's actually kind of an anomaly. Normally we're acting on items, but this, this is an action too, because it's changing our core structure to make sure that we are including the environmental Jedi. So I, I am very excited about it. And we're gonna get stuff, but I think I, personally, I'd really love to see like, if you picked a top priority, Grace, as a new commission member, what would it be? What would your like one, like number one action be? And, and not necessarily for a big discussion right now, but perhaps it could be on the agenda next month. Yeah, very good question, definitely. One thing I would say off the top of my head is I would love to see more um, job training and accessibility, financial accessibility for our renewable stuff, which it sounds like there's already some opportunities there, um, but I don't know of any affordable or free renewable energy job training in the area that's available. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we've had conversations with the CEDRA presentation and I know there's a lot of things underway and it takes some time for city policy, or uh, statewide policies to come to us, um, but I think that job training, particularly for groups of people who have been um, oppressed against or employment-wise in the past, um, it sounds like Solar for All is working towards people with a criminal record who have been affected by the foster care system, all sorts of things, um, and I know those things are underway, but I would love to see it more available in our community. Yes, the, the funding for that comes from Future Energy Jobs Act, which is ratepayers and land ratepayers, and um, the projects uh, that are that are incentivized by Future Energy Jobs Act, such as Urbana's Community Solar Array, will be employing folks that have been put in that that job training pipeline. Are are there um, local training areas? Do you know if there's any assistance with the cost? I think there were. I think there were maybe for partners or something around the state that were partners in, in actually performing the training. I don't think any of them were located in Urbana-Champaign. It was a, a, a select number of, of partners. And I'll mention um, uh, we're, we're, we're working with someone who's graduated from that pipeline, um, with, who's, who's um, in part-time part working for trajectory, trajectory Energy and also doing um, solar builds 
And what she's described is that um, although the community solar arrays are just now sort of getting to the point of construction, folks have gone through the, the job training pipelines through FIJA have already been active regionally um, on other market rate, um, non-Illinois, non-FIJA related solar projects. So they've already been um, gone through the pipeline and, and, are, and are employed. Great. Yeah, when I've looked at it um, for other people who are young people of color looking for jobs and job training, all of the trainings through Midwest Renewable Energy that I found lately have been in neighboring cities an hour away, and it's been one or two thousand dollars more in cost, and so that's been really prohibitive, and so I would love to see that more local and more accessible. You and might then, look at the trade union. I think some of the trade unions were, were partners in the, the FIJA training. I know MREA, MR, MREA has long had renewables training, but I'm not sure that they were part of FIJA actually. So, yeah, so this I think is a very um, prescient dis discussion and one that I would like to continue to have. I think what I should probably do is kind of in this discussion for, for future business, looking at the time. Um, I know that I was a little bit late tonight due to some car trouble, so my apologies for getting started a little bit later and we're getting laptops and things set up so we could look at the, um, the agenda and stuff. But I would like to move into announcements and um, I guess just first say thank you to everybody for your participation in, in the call this evening. I think that we've had an excellent dialogue here tonight and that was um, very um, informative and rather enjoyable as well. So thank you all for um, your patience and for the conversation this evening. I think that we are moving in a really great direction with, with these conversations and again with the, with the bylaws work that they're working on. I think it has made all of us do some reflection on our purpose as part of SAC and how we think a little bit about um, sustainability and the way that that is impacted in our lives. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, for announcements, the SAC has um, a immediate opening for a commission member seat and to apply to be a member of the SAC, please fill out the form that can be found um, on the Urbana website. I believe that that is on the mayor's page. And more information can be found under our board page for the Sustainability Advisory Commission as well. Um, secondly, the University of Illinois has created a COVID-19 contact tracing app, which is available to anyone and more information about that can be found at safer.illinois.edu. Are there any other announcements this evening? Yes, the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment on campus is hosting a, I don't want to get the, the words right, um, hosting a community conversation to explore the idea of using micronuclear advanced reactor technology uh, on campus to help meet campus energy and greenhouse gas reduction goals as outlined in the Illinois Climate Action Plan. It is uh, next Thursday and if you would like to attend and be able to ask a question during the event, um, through a moderated chat, uh, you would need to register at go.illinois.edu slash nuclear conversation. Uh, it will also be live streamed on Facebook, but I don't think you can ask a question through the and to the panelists through the Facebook site. Um, this is something that is one of the clean energy possibilities for meeting the campuses um, or for moving towards clean uh, carbon neutral energy for campus. Thank you. Can you just send the details to that to Scott so that we can be sure to include it? 
in, in I guess, the minutes as they go out? Yes. Thank you. And also there is a uh, National Green Infrastructure Certification Program that is um, sometimes referred to as NGICP and it is hosted at Parkland. They are the only licensed provider of this um, training, this certification program in the state of Illinois. And they will have their, um, their educational, you can, you can get the certificate for a lower cost through an online opportunity this fall. So it's my understanding that it's about $399. And I think in the past it was more like six or $900. So it's a pretty good deal uh, if you're interested in getting, it's going to be October 5. Um, I can send that to Scott as well. Yeah, is that, who is the targeted audience for that? It's interesting. It's people who want to um, be involved in supporting or installing or educating folks about green infrastructure. Um, Scott, I know you've attended, you've, you've spoken at it. I don't know if you actually attended. I had not attended it in the past. There's a variety of attendees, um, landscapers, landscape architects, engineers, uh, environmental scientists, It's a really good, strong program. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for sharing those opportunities. And yeah, I will echo with Stacy. I would love to have uh, concrete details in an email. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. Okay. All right, with no other or with no further business before the commission this evening, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting adjourned. Great to see everybody. Thank you for joining.